Welcome back to another episode of the Two Christian Dudes podcast. We are nearing the end of season one, and so Randy and I are wrapping up our last few near-death experience interviews. To some degree, I think we've saved the best for last. I know many of you are just going to be, I'm going to say, enraptured uh, by what our guest today has to share. He has an amazing testimony. We're so excited to have Rabbi Felix Halpern on the show with us today, and so let me bring Felix and Randy into the show, and we will get this conversation started. Randy, take it away, sir. This is truly an honor. Um, our guest uh, has a special message for us. He is a messianic believer. For those of you who may not be familiar with that term, he uh, had been a Jewish rabbi. And then he came to know Jesus as his Messiah, uh, as we say, a believer in, in Jesus. Uh, Christ is how we refer Jesus as uh, in, in the Western world. And uh, to the Jewish uh, person, Jesus the Messiah is the appropriate term for them uh, because that has meaning to them. Uh, and uh, Felix will get Felix Halpern will get into that discussion as to what that means because we're going to ask him to explain that that process whereby he became a believer in Jesus the Messiah, and uh, he was a successful businessman and uh, worked in the diamond business, and so you're going to be absolutely enthralled by his story. At the very end, will be an opportunity that some of you will have that will just change your life, transform your life as, mm -hmm. as uh, Felix prays with us. So Felix, it's just an honor to have you as a guest. Let's start with, with your uh, process as to how you became a believer and your business and where you would like to go in terms of, of how all of this started. And then we'll uh, segue into your afterlife experience. So great to have you. Surely. Thank you so much, uh, Randy and Sean. I thank you. It's a uh... It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to share my heart. It's always an honor to share what God is doing uh, in our lives. And certainly as a Jewish person who's come to know Yeshua as the Messiah, it's probably the most unexpected event that a Jewish person can imagine taking in their life. Um, my father's side was uh, raised Orthodox. My grandfather was an Orthodox rabbi. And they were on my paternal line we were all killed in the Holocaust. So my father was the only survivor and came to uh, an understanding of some sense of Yeshua, uh, but not taking root in the, in the Dutch underground, which uh, I was born in the Netherlands. And, uh, and over the years, as I began to grow uh, and have this yearning for greater and greater understanding, uh, the Lord uh, brought people into my life. Uh, that began to lead me down the path and began to see things uh, in a way that's completely opposite of what we have come to understand as Jewish people. And in the mid-70s, I had a profound experience with Yeshua, uh, became, quote unquote, as they say, born again. But truly, you do become a born as a new creation. Something changes inside of you, uh, a, a transformation. And I began to uh, appreciate the fact that uh, I have become fulfilled. I've become a completed Jew. Uh, I haven't become someone else. I don't, don't become um, uh, a Gentile Christian or this or that, however we label it. I'm a Jewish believer in Yeshua. Uh, and we, as, uh, you know, we've come to understand the importance of that. And so the Lord began to work in my life. Um, I started working in the in the diamond and gold business on 47th street and the lord had kept me with the ultra orthodox and the hasidic communities uh, for 25 years and the lord blessed the work i was vice president of a company um enjoying what i did i loved what i did but i had come to the point where i loved the lord so much more and i remember uh at 45 years old um, I mean, I, have, I knew the Lord, I've known the Lord for over 45 years, but there was a point in time that Lord uh, brought us through a sovereign revival, the revival that was happening in our life. And I remember he said um, at my office on 47th Street, 
that uh, I'm bringing you back to your people. And the Lord said, I want you to uh, liquidate your retirement. I want you to liquidate your savings accounts. I want you down to zero uh, because I want to take you on a life of faith that you have to learn. And I'm going to lead you like I led Moshe. And my Hebrew name happens to be Moshe. I didn't make that immediate connection. Uh, but, but I had this encounter with God as a Jewish man. The Lord spoke through the spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, so profoundly. And, uh, and this was the, uh, the message I'm bringing back to my Jewish wife from Brooklyn, who um, never knew what a bill was, never knew what a car payment was, never knew what an insurance payment was. We built a house six months earlier, had a high mortgage. My daughter was perhaps uh, half a dozen years away from college. And this is what I'm going to home to share with my wife. And, um, but praise the Lord. Uh, she had already known what I was about to share with her. And she said, I know what you're going to tell me. And she said, we will trust God and we will take a step of faith. And quite honestly, in short order, um, I resigned my position as, as vice president uh, within six months. And off we went and we took this plunge of faith. Uh, I always give this testimony often and I tie it into faith because the adventure of faith is one moment you are captain of the Starship Enterprise going where you have never gone before. But the next moment you can feel like you're captain of the Titanic where everything is coming down. Those quantum leaps of faith is the adventure with God. And I can tell you, um, ever since that, the Lord supernaturally provided in means that we would never, ever, ever be able to uh, calculate, predict, factor into what this faith will cost us. No, the Lord just was a miraculous hand of provision. And then we, um, we start a congregation, a messianic congregation. Um, that was very birth out of revival, what God was doing profound things in our life for 20 some odd years. Uh, our people, Jewish people were coming in and getting saved. Miracles were happening. It was in the time of the Pensacola, uh, Toronto time where we were kind of just swept in. And, um, and it was an extraordinary time, extraordinary time. And my wife, who was raised as a conservative uh, Jewish girl and and now and has always loved the Lord, had profound experiences as a child. God was speaking to her in dreams and visions. And so she was already predetermined. She was already um, at a place where God was going to use her life and how the Lord brought us together. Walking through that experience and, 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 under, and that adventure with God, there was a time when, before we went into the Messianic ministry and Messianic call to our people, the Lord woke me up at 3 a.m. in the morning to his audible voice. And to my left ear, I can hear it as we are speaking. I'm bringing you back to your people. And that was a turning point uh, for my life in terms of what we have done over the course of the last 25 years. But never, ever have we or could we imagine or could I imagine really uh, what God would do with my life as a result of a doctor's error. Um, we just had to come back from a trip. Uh, we, we take people to Israel every two years. So we, on our, we were coming back from our June trip. And in June, I had a, a, an amazing experience at the wall for the first time in all the times I've gone to Israel. And um, I felt prompted to go pray, and I put my hand on the wall, and nothing really happened. Uh, one of the Messianic rabbis from Brazil that was with us, um, as I turned around and walk away, he said, you need to go back. God wants you back there. And as soon as I went back there at the second time, I put my hand on the wall, and I was just, I just broke. I went down to my knees. And I felt the literal presence of Yeshua, Jesus, walking up from behind me, coming through the crowd of the Orthodox, hundreds and hundreds of Orthodox there, coming through there and putting his hand on my shoulder 
pushed me down. I went down, prostrate at the wall. And the Lord um, said to me, uh, do not be discouraged. Do not be, do not grow critical of my people here. I love them and they will come soon to love me. So do not grow weary in what I've called you to do. Do not grow critical, but begin to love them more than ever because they don't even know that I walk amongst them here and they don't see me. They don't know me, but know that I am coming soon. Well, that just arrested me. I mean, that just profoundly left me impacted to such a degree that when I got home, I was no good to anybody. I mean, I could not get back to living. I literally was driving my wife, Bonnie, crazy. She's saying, what is going on? And I said, Bonnie, I don't know. I said, I feel that the Lord said something's not done. It's not finished. I'm supposed to go back. And, you know, so I'm sorting through what is the spiritual calling, what is emotionally. I go back to Israel anytime. I'm trying to discern. But three weeks later, I could not shake this unshakable yearning uh, that I'm compelled to go back. For what? I don't know. But I said to Bonnie, my wife, I said, I only know this. I need to go back for seven days. Every morning, I'm going to the Wailing Wall and I'm going to pray. That's it. And I said, I'm going to wait for God. I, I believe he's supposed to meet me where he spoke to me and I'm supposed to go back. And for seven days, I did that every morning. And then at, in the afternoon, when it came time to leave, when I felt the unction of the spirit, it's time to leave. We, I left. I had one other person with me and we had an amazing divine uh, appointments, was able to pray over a Hasidic man whose eyes uh, he was able to see because his eyes were terrible. He couldn't see more than an inch in front of him. We had these profound, miraculous times in Israel. And, um, and we had many divine appointments and encounters, which would take longer to go into at this point. But when we were done with our seven-day prophetic trip, I came back and I went for my annual physical. Everything was fine. My, my health was always, has always been good. And the doctor misdiagnosed me with a condition and gave me, uh, with mis uh, actually misdiagnosed me with a thyroid condition, which was, was wrong. And she prescribed a medication uh, incorrectly where I consumed uh, seven and a half months of medication in 29 days when I didn't need it to begin with. And immediately with, well, I wouldn't say immediately, within a couple days, within three, four days, uh, looking back, my body began to manifest what doctors call an inner storm. Uh, I was just tremendous tension and pressure and pain. My, my body felt like a furnace. Um, I thought it was spiritual, quite frankly. I thought it was part of the manifestation of my profound experiences. I'm saying this is spiritual, I think. This can't be physical because I'm healthy. And so this went on for a month. And every night it was that way. It was building and building until one night in September. Uh, it was the most difficult night out of the entire month where I felt everything typically of the symptoms of a cardiac arrest the pain in the shoulder, the pain in the arm, pain in the chest. And um, I didn't tell Bonnie about it I because I, I said, I'm going to go down at 3 a.m. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. And I said, I'm going to just go down and I'm going to rest and believe that it's going to go away. It's going to go away. But it didn't. And I went down at 3 a.m. to lay down and it didn't take very long. And my heart just stopped. And uh, it, that was it. My soul, um, my soul stepped out of my body like I'm getting up from a night's sleep. Just jumped, almost jumped out of my body. Couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> it seems. I don't know. I don't know what that's about. 
but I don't blame the soul to get out. I, you know, we won't, you know, no confinement. Anyway, the soul just left and um, my soul, my spirit began to rise in the room. And it was lying horizontally at that point. And from a height above, I was able to um, see my lifeless body on the couch. I saw a bit into the future. I saw my, I saw Bonnie and my children planning my funeral. And I saw the grief and the sorrow on them. It, it, it was not even momentary. It was the only time something like that entered my being that I was aware of. And this, and the angel, an angel, a powerful angel, um, was almost, I felt, uh, Sean and Randy, like I was just brought into an emergency room. And I'm laying on an operating table and the doctors are working on me. But this angel was moving his hand over me and I had this sense that he's ministering to my soul. I didn't know what that meant until what I, my life is today. It only had meaning eight, 17 months, 15 months later, I, I began to understand something. And in that place, you know, we, I, I saw the, uh, a white light, a cone shaped cylindrical light up, up into the right hand side of me, which I knew was heaven. It was a brightness at the end of it. And in no time, I am before the throne of God. When I share about the, the life and death aspect of it, um, I, it's hard for me to talk about because I feel in that moment the fragility of my physical life, the tearing between the mortal and the immortal. It just like, you know, almost feel like my, I feel like every, my chest can just like collapse inside because of that. I can live that moment when it, when it happens and what it really means. Um, and so, the Lord brought me into the heavenlies. The Lord brought me to that place that I was before the throne and the, it was surrounded by a ring of impenetrable, impenetrable fire. Ripples, like ripples of fire that was imperceivable in terms of its depth. It couldn't be penetrated. Really. And I was on my face at that point. Well, Felix, let, let, uh, I want to give you just a, a momentary break. So we've had you talking for a while. Um, yeah. In the terms of the, the experience of, of leaving your body and your soul rising up, see, seeing that light, like, were you actively thinking anything like, oh, wow, what, what's happening? I'm, I'm, I'm going to heaven. Or were you just so enraptured by the experience that you were just kind of going through it? No, in, in, in the immediate, in the immediacy, I realized my circle of life had ended. I, I immediately, I knew my circle of life had come to an end. That immediate awareness at the point of when the soul I think at the point of when the soul began to step out, I knew what that was. And I said, my circle of life has come to an end. You know, so that that awareness was there in, in that split second. Okay. And in, uh, so in terms of... Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the angel you encountered, uh, had you encountered angels before? Did you immediately realize that was an angel and when, when the angel's kind of uh, giving you triage, we might say? Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I had an encounter with an angel uh, 25, 30 years ago when we went into revival and God was doing some amazing, profound, supernatural things. 
uh, but that was the only time. Um, ever since that this has happened, um, it has become more common. I mean, even going to Sid Roth, there was an angel in the car. <laughs> in the studio, there was angels in the, in the studio. There was an angel in the, in the uh, hotel room on the assignment. In fact, it took, takes me eight hours to drive from New Jersey to Charlotte. I, we drove, I drove nonstop. And when I got there, if you said to me, let's go to Miami, I'd say, okay, let's go. I, I had, there was no fatigue. It was amazing, amazing. It's almost like the Lord sent an angel to lift us up and carry us. And it was the same way going back. Felix, it, it, I am absolutely enthralled with uh, the throne of God and your experience before the throne of God. You are prostrate. Tell us about the effect of that, what you saw, how you experienced God before the throne room uh, when, when you entered uh, heaven. One of the lingering, one of the lingering effects is that when I'm worshiping in the presence, I have to cover my eyes uh, when I think about it, because the brightness, I write this in the book, the brightness was incapable of my, I, I could not handle the brightness of the glory of the fire of God, the presence of God. Um, my opinion is because it was it was it was not meant for me to stay there. Uh, I, I probably the 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 redeemed and who are there it, it different, but my eyes were not too able to absorb the fullness of the fire. My eyes felt heat, and I covered my body. I was down prostrate before the Lord, and. Um, and the only other thing that I can say is no th absence of any thought. It is just in the presence, in the presence of God himself, in the presence of the glory. And so the only thing I was able to do was go down. You know, I have to I have to interject, uh, Felix, because we had a chance to uh, talk before the show. And one of the pleasures I've experienced is just the uh, the koinonia, the familiarity that we have in some of our experiences. I have to say that you in particular, I identify with so, so well, because you have experienced the awe of God being in the presence of the glory and that glory uh, transcended into your, into your return as well. Yeah. Uh, and so you became a, uh, a changed person as a result of that. It's almost as though the glory of God was so effusive and so, uh, so brilliant that uh, you experienced that as, as a messianic believer in a way that it was almost a, like I'm I'm home. I'm, this is uh, I found the Messiah. Now right. I'm in the presence of the glory of God, and I am changed forever. And it has translated into your uh, life and your ministry, hasn't it? Well, I, you know, you touched on something, Randy, that uh, that is makes a distinction from and many distinctions, but a delineation from my former life. Um, I've always had a love for people. That's why I went in to serve the Lord. I love people. Had a heart for the lost. Had a heart for people's lives and people to be healed and so forth. Uh, but the love that I came back with is on a different, it's different. It's entirely different. It's the love of God. It's a love that when I see someone, I could weep. When I read of Yeshua, who wept the crowd, it than the people. Uh, I get it. I get it. I, I can't honestly say that I had that. Um, I had the love of, for people and ministered in that regard. But now there's a love that is 
in completely enraptures your soul in a way that you must touch them because it's not us, it's now him touching people through us who are nothing. We're just empty nothing. And he uses us to channel his, that supernatural love. That, that has been a profound effect as, on my personal life as well, for sure, for sure. I don't, think, I don't know how you can come back without it. I, I, you know, <laughs> right? I don't know how you can come back unchanged. I don't, you know, the, the Lord, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. We could touch on that later, the difference between when the Lord said, you have a choice. When I returned, the Lord gave me a choice. This will be transformational or it will be transactional. And a transformational is going to come at a price. Transactional, I knew what that meant. This will eventually wear off. I'll get back into my life. We'll talk about it. And I'll share with people how this happened in the, you know, back then. <laughs> transformational would be the character of my life because it will come at a price. And I was willing, and I said to the Lord, I will pay that price because I was not about to go back and lose what he did. You know, the reality in, in, our, in our lives, anyone who goes through this, the reality never leaves you that he chose to give us our life back. I could have, you know, that night, I mean, my doctor told me when I went in for my exam, um, you know, for six months following that, I went through tests to have my organs checked and liver and kidneys and so forth and so on. And uh, to see if that toxicity damaged anything. My doctor said to me, I have no, I have no explanation other than your blood work looks like a young stag. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm 69 years old. I got I got many years ahead of me. But um but to see the Lord do that, right? And to see the Lord transform your life like that for me is uh, a complete shift for the rest of my days because he gave me my life back. And uh, and I think that that's why it resonates with so many people. This topic, the service that, quite frankly, uh, Randy and, and Sean, what you're doing, because people are looking for truth. People are looking for hope. They're looking for something supernatural. They're coming out of the dark period. I feel like they're coming out of the COVID. Like millions of people are coming out of a dark forest, and they're breaking. The light is breaking through for the first time, and they're disillusioned and trying to say what they're trying to put life back together again. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, we've seen hundreds, if not thousands of people. I mean, uh, some of these videos have gone far and wide across the globe. And just the one thing that comes through over and over again is people are desperate for that hope of heaven. Uh, and, you know, I, I tend to look at these interviews as a publishing guy for these conversations. And, and I, I want to hit the highlights of the story. I want to make an impact and tell a story while in an interview. And I, I think one of one of the things that God has used these interviews to help me realize is how important it is to get these stories out because it does give people that hope of heaven that there is something actually on the other side when they cross yeah. the veil. And and I love Felix how much your story parallels with Randy in terms of when you came back. Both of you gentlemen are so marked by the love of God, and not that you didn't love people before, but the depth shifted on on this side of your experience I, I love that connection point between you two right, uh, right. felix i want to get back to the fire that you saw around sure. the throne sure. um was that I, I know you've had some time to process that was it a representation of the glory of god was there a, a refining element of being in the presence of that I, i'm just curious if you've had I, any I more think, thoughts on the fire i think it was the absolute purity and the glory and the nature of who God is. I did not interpret it as refining fire in, in heaven. Everything there is refined. Everything is perfection. 
Everything is in its state of the way he created it and has never changed. It is perfection. As we think of my, I don't even know if there's an adequate word to express a word beyond perfection. I don't think there's, there are words that are inadequate in our, in our English language to really describe it. But I believe that it is the fire, the purity, the heat, the absolute refinement of what refinement is. For example, in my years in the gold business, I worked for many years in a gold refinery. So I know how to refine gold. I've, I've handled you know gold bars coming in and then melted and understand it to come to its perfect purity it's, and so forth. So I understand that aspect of refinement. Um, but the refining fire and the gold, if you will, of heaven is beyond purity of whatever we think of. It's beyond 99999. <laughs> it's, beyond, it's beyond that. And, um, but the fear, the fear, the reverential fear that is around that is profoundly so deep in our life and in what we could comprehend that we could not handle it in the natural. And, and uh, the Felix, you talk about the natural and transform transformational versus transactional. You know, God gave you uh, kind of a choice. It seems as though you would accept that transformation, or you would go back to the transactional because you had been in the diamond business, the gold business. All of those are really uh, monetary. They are monetized. Uh, they right. are the the gold standard we know of, uh, which is uh, how much more. Uh, commercial can you get than that? And yet God was telling you, as I understand it, that you were to give all of that up, that you had that choice and to follow him. So that not only were you transformed in terms of your love for others, but also he was requiring something of you in order to right. move forward in your ministry, right. serving yeah. service to him. Tell us about that. I remember a Friday night in a worship service, we had already uh, for many, for a number of years, felt the tug of the spirit of God calling us into service. Um, I just couldn't find a way to get there. To me, serving the Lord was or what we call ministry, but serving the Lord seemed like climbing Mount Everest. And every time I felt something advancing, I find myself slipping down the mountain again not getting traction to move forward. And I remember one Friday night, the Lord said to me in a Friday night, not audible voice, but a clear conviction of the spirit in, in right spoken into my inner self. Um, I cannot give you what you want because your job has become your security. Your security has become your work, your income. And I knew then, at that point, that I needed to resign my position. Now, you know, in the early, in the 1980s or 85s, you can, I don't know if you want to keep this in there, but just for context, you know, I'm making $140,000 $140, plus in 1982 and 83. <laughs> that was a lot of money back then. And, um, and the Lord is saying, I need to leave. I need to resign my position. And we, we did. Six months later, we did. Resigned and took our step of faith and went on our Abrahamic journey. My testimony that the Lord has always given us to the Jewish people or anybody is that it's okay to enjoy what you do. Solomon says there's nothing better, nothing better than a man to enjoy the fruit of his labor. Nothing wrong with that. It's a matter of what we love more. Um, the Lord used our life to impact a lot of business people in our congregation that came in. When they heard the testimony, they saw what we did. 
Um, we didn't, we didn't, um, I, I was, I didn't lose my job. I didn't lose my home. I didn't do these things. We walked away from them for God. That's not to say that that's what people are supposed to do, but that's what the Lord had us do because of the sphere of influence that we would bring to Jewish people who very much can serve the spirit of mammon, where we live in a very materialistic area, the Northeast, where we labor. And, um, and that has been used by the Lord to really bring a sense of a new fire and a revival to people where you can love what you do, you can prosper greatly, but the key is, is loving him above all. And I believe that's one of the things the Lord used our life for, to, to show that. And, and the Lord has been faithful. Um, similarly, he said this could be transmit, transformational or transactional. And um, I, I felt it was the same choice when we went into revival. Our life was turned upside down by the glory of God. We had so many manifestations and miracles. But um, even then... I think that anybody or anybody that has a has a um, an experience with God of any supernatural substance like the, what we're speaking about, there is always the choice, transformational or transactional. I think that's always the case. I've seen so many people who went through revival and they're back where they started, you know, because God begins a work and he wants to complete that. Um, I believe that the Lord, I mean, through a doctor's error, the Lord gave me my life back. But it could have been where he said, no, I'm not giving you back and I wouldn't be here. But I believe that the there's an assignment that comes to us. It's part of the call. It's part of the responsibility. So I live differently. I eat differently. I live slower. I write about this in the book. I live slower. I'm more, I live life more as an observer. And I will also say, and I don't mind saying it because I write about it. It's taken, it's taken some time for my children and my wife to adjust to it because I'm a different person. I can't change and you can't change it. And so I'm adjusting in with measured steps and how to balance it all because the Lord did not, when he brought me back, I tell, I like to say, uh, he didn't put me back together the same way. He gave me some keys that are absolute the assignment of my life. And I'm more connected now to my spiritual being than ever. Than ever. Sometimes I can be, I can still see from above certain things. I don't know, Randy, if, if you've had that experience, but you know, the body, soul, and spirit, for me, there's daylight between the three. I live each day with a realistic, tangible awareness of the three. And in my first three days back, the Lord said, I'm going to put you in one book, actually two books, but that's another story. But Ezekiel and Psalms. Ezekiel had to do with the, the calling of God to the Jewish people. And I was in those two books for two years. Who does that? <laughs> I mean, literally, I was in, you know, out of 66 books of the Bible, I'm in two. And the Lord says, I'm going to put you in the book of Psalms and you're going to eat from that book. And then the Lord opened up understanding that in the book of Psalms, I, it is truly the handbook of the soul. If anybody wants to know about the relationship between the soul and the spirit, it's in only, it's only in the book of Psalms, over 50 verses. Oh, my soul, why are you downcast? It's like, it's like the second person, right? Randy, why are you so troubled? <laughs> the psalmist speaks to his soul that way. Oh, my soul, come and worship the Lord. And it begins to unfold the important relationship that we have in the spirit um, governing the soul, that the soul constantly comes into submission. But it's beyond that, too. The Psalms is the handbook of God's glory. There we learn how to give 
magnification and enlargement to him. And can we pause for a minute? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm not uh, sure if I'm going off the beaten path. (laughs) Not not at all, Felix. And I uh, just since I know you. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Uh, Felix, just in context here. Also, and I'll uh, defer to uh, Sean because I know he has a a question for you. Uh, Your experience, your afterlife experience was September 2019. Correct. And so we have had guests on who have had afterlife. Mine was, uh, you know, now almost 15 years ago. So yours is fairly fresh in in your experience. And so, Sean, that uh, back to you in terms of, kind of the, the variance of experiences. And uh, obviously we've talked to Felix about, you know, his transformation now post this experience and that it's still relatively fresh and though it's only, a, you know, a couple of years away. So how do you, how do you interpret that from your vantage point, Sean, in terms of, of how that fits with, uh, with other stories that we've heard? And obviously we're speaking to somebody who, um, has been Jewish, is Jewish currently, and is a mess, Messianic uh, Jew, and somebody who experienced God on those terms, um, which are also unique to our stories. Well, I guess one of the things I would say, and I actually want to defer back to you on something to comment on as well, Randy, but we're just too, we're just too cordial. Um, <laughs> one of the things I really appreciate, Felix, in terms of the people we've connected with, where this is still very near, I think uh, one gal we had on earlier in this season, she was within like a year of her near death experience. And we've had a few others where it was, was within like a window of anywhere from one to three years. And, um, there is something profound about kind of the, the rawness and the newness where I feel like, you know, as you have conversations with people, they're still kind of actively in that process of understanding and processing. Like, like it was very different to talk to Ian McCormick, who had his experience in the early eighties, I believe is when it was or late seventies, somewhere in there, you know, and he's told his testimony many times and he's been processing this with God for so many years. And so there's, I feel like there can be a difference, um, between, you know, somebody who it's, it's still very new or they've been, uh, commenting about this for the while, for a while. Randy, I don't want to lose this though, because, um, Felix had, had, uh, mentioned about kind of, that I, I think I've heard him describe it as kind of that envelope always remaining a bit open. Um, right. I would describe it as the veil always being partly pulled back. I, I'm curious, Randy, in in your experience where you're always, you know, kind of having a foot in both worlds, if you will, if if your experience is somewhat similar to what Felix described. I, I don't want to lose that. So I'd love for you to comment on that. Yeah, my affinity uh, for Felix, even though our lives have been very different are just, I feel, I feel just a kinship with Felix that is, uh, I feel like he's, uh, the proverbial brother from another mother, you know, he's just, (laughs) he's that, he's that close. And the connection that I felt that I don't know if it was the same for you, Felix, but that's incredible to me because our experience is the glory of God being in the presence of the glory of God. There is a there's a transference of that that power that glory that is tra- tr- truly transformational. I love how you use the word transformational, Felix, because when I left my experience, uh, you know, having having died, and I came back and I entered into the corporate world, mm-hmm. and I had a very different mission, but I was reticent in moving into the world right. of ministry. So right. I, 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 God had not yet called me or assigned me to, to even tell my story. Mm-hmm. And we have talked about this, Felix, uh, in terms of uh, telling the story, because there are certain parts of heaven that defy explanation. There just aren't terms right. that are adequate right. to describe it. And yet, you know, we, we share our experiences in order to help people draw closer to God through, through confirmation of their belief. And also um, there is almost a supernatural drawing in from people hearing these stories because they, they see that, okay, this, this thing is real. And what, what surprised me in the process, um, 
to both of you and to our audience was that even believers mm -hmm. have this shadow of a doubt, and maybe it's more than a shadow, that this may not be so real. And you see people transition where they will, uh, they will go through a, a death process where they're struggling and striving and fearful. And there are others that just are at peace. And their transition That's is true. very, very easy and very comforting. So um, back to you, Felix, on this, because your experience now is, is just on fire. I mean, you are sharing the love of God. You're looking at uh, things in a, in a much more appreciative way. Uh, the book of Psalms has fed your soul and enlivened uh, your spirit is in constant yeah. communion with the Lord. And you have this vantage point that is unique because you have this confirmation of faith, having, having witnessed the Lord God. So how does that translate into your life uh, from when you returned initially when you woke up? I'd like to get to the moment where you actually uh, came back to this world. <laughs> There's a straight contrast. Was there any remorse or did you, what, what was your initial reaction and how did that happen when, when you went from that point of being in the throne room to now you're back in your body? Um, there was a period of time where I don't feel that I was ever fully back in my body. I feel that, um, and I still, if I just want to just touch on what you were just saying and then come back to this, is that the separation uh, that I feel, uh, the detachment, the detachment from the mortal realm, carrying with me always a sense of immortality on my shoulder, if you will. The ability, the, the experience of the freedom when the soul is set free only gives me, the, I can give the example of what a bird must feel like that is going to leave the house for the first time and it feels the wind under its wing for the first time. That freedom, that sense has really never left me. And there's a time, there are times when, uh, to be quite frank about it, I say, Lord, I can't do this anymore. Because you're detached. And so there's a, there's a learning how to live with that. And at the same time, I don't want it to change. Not for the sake of the experience, but no, I don't want it to change because I want to live in the state when even Jesus said that we are in this world, but we are not of it. And I am no longer of this on a level that I have never, ever experienced. Yet there's a, such an amazing peace and presence of God. And when I came back in, this, in, that, in those moments, I saw my wife's face and I saw what would um, what would be. It's taken her this long to forgive me for not calling 911. Hmm. I just didn't think about I just didn't think it was that. <laughs> I just did not make the connection. I I ignored all the signs. And um and so, um, you know, I don't know how you feel, but sometimes I can feel like I'm an ant on the earth. Sometimes I feel like I'm walking. I, I take my morning walks. I write about this and I enjoy the God, everything he does. But I can feel like I, I'm, I'm one man on the entire planet. I've had that sense. I'm on the planet. <laughs> You know, and, and Sean, um, this is how a lot of us feel, I think, that we are, uh, a lot of us feel like disconnected from this world, yeah. especially in the midst of all of But <laughs> yes, but we are truly foreigners in this world. Yes. Um, yes. I don't know yes. that any of us have said, oh, I wanted to come back. You know, I wanted to, come, I wanted to return from this paradise. 
uh, and being in the presence of the Lord to, to now in this broken world, we are foreigners in, in, a, in a, such a real sense of that term. Strange, right. You're strangers in a strange land. Like you, you profoundly feel how much we are not of this world, that we were created right for heaven. Yeah. We were created to be in God's presence. And um, because you've experienced the, the fullness or kind of the consummation of that, if you will, there, I, I would imagine it kind of feels like there's a part of you missing being back here, so to speak. Well, I came back with this sense is that um, I, I learned this. I'll put it this way. There's such a thing as a quality separation. And had I left, it would have been a part, I believe, a partial separation. There's a point in time when the Lord, when it's time to go home, he brings us home. But the Lord doesn't want so many people living the way they do. They can't wait for the rapture. Uh, they can't wait to go home to be with the Lord. No, God's God, you know, Yeshua says it, that he's chosen to keep us in this world. And I believe that every single person has a has an a, has a, an appointment, a destiny, a calling to fulfill. And God doesn't want us leaving prematurely. I don't believe it gives God pleasure that people sit and can't wait to be in heaven. Because they're missing something in the here and now. They're missing the fullness of the life in the here and now that God has given us. And I realize that when I leave again, I will be a full separation, a, what I call a quality separation, where I have fulfilled my mission, my purpose. And so I came back with such an appreciation for life. I don't want to go back because I'm not done. And that, that's, that, I love that's life a now. I love life and the, and the and not more than that, of course not. But I love that he gave my life back and showed me now you must live and accomplish what I've called you to do. Jesus died for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a strike con, striking contrast to uh, selfishly wanting to be in paradise versus right. knowing that we have a calling, we have a purpose, and that needs to be fulfilled. That to to usurp that purpose or to end it prematurely would be to deny God um, that that pleasure of us fulfilling our unique purpose. So, right. so Sean, you know, when when uh, you know Felix, I think is unique to me in just our encounters, brief encounters, in that there's such a heart after the lost, and we're going to be praying at the end of this for the lost. But God grieves. It's not a sense of grief that we have for right. lost. Right. It's a grief of separation from those who are lost. And so many, and there's some that may be joining us who have a, are, are of a, a Jewish persu persuasion. That is, you're Jewish, but you're kind of traditional, more the traditional um, Jewish belief, um, or or not at all. And so... Sean, from the perspective of the uniqueness we began the show of um, the messianic believer that I think can speak to the Gentile population, if you will, um, how, the, the, the desire to see people know the Lord, how does that, how do you see that, Sean, in terms of um, these uh, afterlife or near-death experiences and how that and it gives us a sense of urgency that, you know, we, we need to fulfill our purpose, but also those who are not, do not know Jesus as the Messiah, that they need to, uh, they need to do that. I mean, there's, there's no promise of a tomorrow. Well, Randy, you and I have talked about this uh, in, in previous episodes, how after being in heaven and just kind of saturated to even your pores being filled, so to speak, with God's love and how, uh, you know, you gentlemen have both expressed coming back dramatically, profoundly changed in terms of empathy, love, how you feel about um, others, the lost. I, you know, my, my sense after all the conversations we've had is you get to capture a piece of God's heart for the people God has you on assignment for. And, and clearly Felix has a, a call to reach the Jew for Jesus, if you will. And, you know, Randy, you and I have different calls in terms of the people um, God is calling us to connect with and reach out to as well. And so I, I, you know, I, 
I, I don't know any other way to describe it than, you know, because you've been so saturated to overflowing that there's an aspect of God's heart for the people that he has a calling for you to reach, um, that it, it somehow manifests, uh, in that way. I don't, I don't know any other way to describe it. So Randy mm -hmm. Felix, I don't know if you've more, uh, more commentary on that in terms of on this side of your journey, in terms of your burden, your assignment, like how does, how does what you perceive as God's heart play into that? You know, one of the, one of the gifts, I call it the gift in, in, in the book, a rabbi's journey to heaven, because it is a gift that was given to me. And I asked the Lord, is this only for me because I went to heaven and the experience, or is this transferable? And I always say, you know, like Randy, we know that what we went through is not transferable. But our life and lessons and who we are today is transferable. That can help imprint people for greater glory for, for the Lord. And when the Lord said to me in the book of Psalms, you'll be in it for, you're going to be in the book of Psalms for uh, 30 days. That turned out to be 60 days, 90 days, turned out to be 18 months. Um, but what the Lord did was when I came back, I could not accept the world as it was when I left. In, in, in the area of typical Christian church culture, certain things. I, couldn't, I could not see myself going back to certain things. One of them was prayer. The Lord revealed the difference between transformational prayer and transactional prayer. That is changing people's lives. And the only reason I talk about this is because I'm, I'm back. I was given my life back to talk about. It. Otherwise, I wouldn't even know about it. And the soul cleanse, the heaven soul cleanse that comes in the book that people are going through now, turns convention on its head. Because if we think about it, Let's say that 80% of our prayer life is consumed with transacting something with God, right? We're asking God to heal, to bless, to move, to touch our ministries, etc. It's always asking God for something. That in itself is not wrong yet, what I'm about to say. And maybe 20% maybe of our life, prayer life, is in what I call the transformational space, the 200 some odd verses about just giving God glory. Transactional prayer has always, is always dominated by I, me, mine. Transformational prayer is always dominated by you, Father, Him, talking about the Lord God. And I began to realize that. Um, Transactional prayer is a need-based prayer life because we live in a need-based planet, planet Earth. Heaven is easy. Earth is hard. Um, I've known the Lord for 45 years. I don't think I've ever been without an area that I need prayer for. And I think as long as I stay here, I will always have areas of prayer that I need. And one prayer is answered today and new ones come up tomorrow. You can Pray for your children, your grandchildren, your wife, your family, for on and on and on. Health, it keeps going and going and going. But a cycle of need-based prayer breeds, it can breed a needy spirit, which I believe it does, which hinders the abundant life. And, and, and transformational prayer, the Lord showed me, is rooted in sufficiency. It's a sufficiency mindset. Transactional prayer that's need-based is an insufficiency mindset. We're always needing. It's always insufficient. So the Lord showed, I went on this 30-day soul cleanse that I call rebooting your system. That for 30 days to begin, starve your soul of the natural order of needs and give everyone to give their needs to the Lord for 30 days. Father, I give you my needs for 30 days. And in those 30 days, every morning, do the Psalms that we have put together. 
do no praying other than that. It's like literally a, a liver cleanse. It's like any other cleanse of the body where you abstain from something to recharge the organs, right? What it does is that I have been in that for so long and I don't believe it has anything to do with my heaven experience. My soul and my brain is imprinted with the glory of God, the majesty of God, the things of God, nature. His handprint is everywhere. I look up into the morning sky and I appreciate the majesty of his creation. Even as we speak, my subconscious, I'm in a new operating system. My whole subconscious, my whole consciousness is completely transformed. And what that does is it gets the ceiling feeling out of people's lives and puts them like they're feeling they're living under a sky. And I can close my eyes and heaven is right here. It's not way up there. It's here. You see? And when the Lord gave this, I said that this is the one of the most important antidotes that's to the problems in people's lives, living in a state of fear, living in a state of need. It's in our church culture. Listen, I go to you can go to pastors' meetings. Okay, so we'll sing a couple songs. And but but the rest of the meeting is all about praying for what the needs of the church, what the needs of the people, what the needs are. Imagine if this took place in a person's life. Let's reverse the formula. Imagine 70, 80% of one's life in the transformation space, the glory space, and 20% of one's life in the need-based space. Imagine the effect on your soul. It literally will reboot a person and put them in a new operating system, what I call a heavenly operating system. And I, the Lord, as sure as we're together, and I know many people will watch this, as sure as I'm saying this, the Lord assured me that people can live in the atmosphere of God's glory, get rid of the ceiling feeling, and live what it means to live in the life of abundance. And the only reason that we've never heard about it, it's never been taught in all my years of faith, is because I had to die to come back and to get it. <laughs> I had to, die to get it. I, I love the I love kind of the, the operating I mean, system really. language. Like it's it's time it's time to get your upgrade, uh, yes, if you will. It's time to um, get the upgrade before it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. Um I I love that moving from transactional to transformational. I, yep. I feel like what you're describing, Felix, shows a difference of relationship. Like, um, if I'm just always asking somebody for something, I feel like that's that's a lower level versus if if I move into what you're calling us to with what you just described, um, that that's going to lead to a higher level of relationship, um, moving closer to God's presence or to the throne, if you right. will. And I feel like it, as, as we're closer and in his presence, all those needs that we worry about and we're constantly praying about and worrying about those are met in his presence. Like you don't have to they, they worry are. about it. It's just, it's just taken care of. Um, I want to, I want to, I want to pull us back into heaven for a couple moments. I have sure, a couple sure. things I want to make. Randy wants to pull us down to earth. I'm pulling us back into heaven uh, <laughs> for a moment, if you will. Oh, I don't, I don't, Sean. I'd rather bring no, us no, in no. heaven. So well, what, what, bring what, us what back, we, bring us home. Uh, I, I've got, if you'll let me, I have two different questions I want to ask. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting, Felix, in terms of your expertise and, and what you did professionally, uh, you have experience with precious metals and gemstones. Uh, I would just love a little bit of insight on how that experience kind of informed or impacted what you saw in heaven. Because, you know, I we've had lots of people describe seeing gold and gems and different things. Uh, but, you know, that that was your area of expertise here in this world. So, right. um how did what you saw in heaven exceed what you saw here in the natural? Well, I was by a river, a river, of, a large river. That's whose the water was as um, clear, perhaps clearer than crystal. You know, everything, Randy, everything I see that what I saw, that everything God created has life. Everything was living. 
everything had living quality to it and it was sustainable entirely by the glory of god right in his environment yes but under the river on the riverbeds there were gemstones sparkling gemstones in the riverbed diamonds rubies precious stones semi precious stones diamonds that um and i've handled you know, million dollars worth of diamonds, diamonds that were worth millions of dollars, but nothing, nothing compared to the brilliance and the clarity. And I'm not saying uh, I didn't go down and pick up a diamond, um, but it was obvious to me that there was a, a quality about these stones that is unsurpassed in this earth, in this mortal realm. It's even the the most flawless diamond can't compare to what I believe I saw because of my experience with my eyes in the riverbed because everything is adorned with gemstones of perfection. It's God's design. It's his creativity. You know, so. Go ahead. I don't know. Does that help? Yeah. No, that that was perfect. Thank you for that. And, uh, I'll get in my one last question and then Randy, I will turn it over to you, sir, to bring us on home. So there, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, one of the things I wrote down in my notes, and I don't remember if this was in your conversation with Bob Duvall or if this was in Sid, but you had mentioned um, seeing like demonic hordes in the second heaven. And we've just, we've never had a guest reference that at all. And so I, I just love to uh, hear a little bit about, you know, wh- what was the insight you got out of what you saw a- as you process that? In the period of time, um, and it hasn't closed completely, but in the period of time that followed my return, uh, the envelope, was I can only say, was pretty wide open. Um, Sid Roth put it this way. It's like living in an eggshell cracked with the light always coming in from the other side. That's probably a, a, a better picture of it all. Uh, but the Lord invited me into or above the second heaven to see the second heaven where demons are. And I was standing above the second heaven, a separation, a clear separation, like not, not like a firmament, like we think between heaven and earth, but there was a definitely a separation that I was standing on. And there was a particular demon and there were many in there. But one particular be, uh, demon tried to climb up and grab a hold of my ankle. But it couldn't. And it was pitiful looking. They were horrible looking. They can just have pity on them. Uh, because, number one, I realize that as we go from glory to glory in Yeshua, and we're going from beauty to beauty, not physical beauty, but who we are always coming to a greater reflection of the glory of God, the majesty of Yeshua, right? More Yeshua-like. They're going from decay to decay to decay. And they were horrid looking, horrible looking, um, pitiful in that they, they don't even know that they, ha- they had no authority to come to me. They had no ability to grab a hold of my ankle. And the Lord showed me why. Because I'm covered by the blood of Yeshua. I'm covered by the blood of Yeshua. I came back with an understanding of the kind of authority that we live in daily. It's both passive and aggressive authority. It's aggressive that we can use against the kingdom of darkness, but it's a passive nature. We live in a constant state of victory and power to such a degree that I realized that from my feet, from the ground in which we walk, all the way up to the heavens, that airways, we have complete authority. For that reason, I can raise my hand to the Lord and worship him and the, and the worship and, and everything that's in us in the spirit extends beyond all the way up into the heavens. We have complete authority by the blood of Yeshua. Mm. Amen to that. Mm -hmm. What we've done, what we have done in the church world, we've replaced soul problems with devil problems. Mm. Catch that for a minute. 
people have less problems with the devil, which they don't realize, and they they give more problems to the devil, but really it's soul issues. So we have we have upseated something that's great for the enemy. We've we've uh, inadvertently given him an authority or let him think that he has an authority he just doesn't have. And of course, I can do a teaching on this in the scriptures to back this up. But that brought me back with a level of authority that I live in each day to know that there is no demonic attack. There is no demonic principality that can come against the blood of Yeshua, just like the blood that protected the Israelites in the, in the lentil be, you know, post in the angel of death coming through Egypt, just like the 144,000 are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The blood of Yeshua is so profoundly authoritative and powerful over every demonic principality, over every sickness and disease. And I think that we've even, we've lost that. We've lost the reality of the power of the blood of Yeshua. Now that's a tough, that's a tough topic for Jewish people to understand that. Because the Jewish people are 2000 years away from sacrifice and the shedding of blood. And it's become a, it's become a, a Christian term and a Christian concept. But but it is a very Jewish concept, obviously, they, through the shed blood of the lamb, uh, through uh, the blood on the lentil pimps on the post. I mean, on and on and part of all of Leviticus is about atoning and shedding blood. Um, but I think for us, back to your question, uh, that was transformative to such a degree. Everywhere I go, I wear python boots now when I minister. <laughs> That's great. I, Why do I wear I, python boots? Because it's an immediate lesson. The devil, the serpent, has been cast to the ground. He's under my feet. That's where right. he's going to stay. <laughs> I love, I love that. that. I love that. Yeah. Well, I know, Sean, you like to bring us back to heaven. And yes. what Felix is talking about really is how we will live in heaven. We will live in heaven as worshipful people Correct. to God in a constant state of worship. Right. We will be consumed with the thoughts of Yeshua. We will be consumed by his ways because the spirit is dominant over the soul and we have a new spirit body. We will no longer be distracted by the things of the world. We will be engulfed and immersed in the presence of God Almighty. Yep. And I love that what you write about in your book, uh, Felix, and what you're, you're talking about is how we can take heaven and the model in heaven, which is perfection, and right. transfer that to the way that we live in this world to be focused on God and the things of God to give him thanks, to recognize his, his glory and his presence and his creation in this yeah. world, and thereby inviting the presence of the Lord to take dominance over, over us and our problems and all of the things we are we are consumed by the problems of this world. So if heaven is the model, <laughs> and I right. think we've learned that through these experiences, and and uh, you, Felix, especially, and other guests, heaven is the model of how we should live in this world. Now, Felix, I want to go back to you possible. because yeah. it is possible. Yes, it is possible to do that. It is possible. Now, let's go back to you, Felix, with this. There is, we, we know, you and I have experienced how the Lord desires that all would be saved. doesn't mean that all are saved. It means he is, desires that all would be saved. So we're going to hand this back to you, Felix. This is a very serious moment. And I hope people have stayed with us because this is maybe the, the most important part of this show, of this episode. And that is we're going to hand it back to you. Yep to invite those who do not know Yeshua as their Lord to, to know him personally and in a possessive way. So please uh, pray, uh, lead us in a prayer and an invitation to that prayer, Felix, now, please. Can, if I can just make one comment, Randy and Sean, for a sure. moment. I came back with uh, another message. Uh, that it's no time to die unless 
someone is ready to die. And, and there are things that need to be set right in people's lives to make them ready. And so the premature death of an individual, I want to say God's, I don't believe is God's method of choice. And the method of choice is that our people, the Jewish people, come to faith in Yeshua, the Messiah. And so, uh, Father, in your mighty name, we pray to you, Lord, the God of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Father, there is no one like you. There are no gods greater than you. There are no beliefs that are truer than yours. There is no hope that's greater than yours. Within the sound of our voices, Father, there are those that may be in a hospital room right now, perhaps suffering from COVID, they may be near death. There may be a point in their life where the doctors have given them no hope. I ask, Father, that you would reach into that person's hospital room and heal their body and eradicate that sickness, that cancer, that COVID, that injury. I pray, Father, for that person who is dying of diabetes, they're at the end, there's no organs, there's no hope, there's nothing left for them. Raise them up, I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, that through the sound of our voice and this carried into the airways, that Yeshua Jesus is carried with the message of hope, of life, of strength, that he is the way and he is the only way, that every one of us Father, must come to that determination in our life. Every Jewish person must come to that determination in their life. And so must you come to that determination in your life. Uh, the trouble is, or the issue is, the question is, are you at the end? Uh, because if you should die without knowing him, I learned and saw firsthand what happens when a soul leaves the body. It either rises to heaven and the glory of God or crash lands in hell. It sounds harsh. It sounds terrible. It sounds horrific. It sounds hopeless, but it is because the decision that needs to be made must be made on this side. There is no other chance to make the decision on the other side, regardless of what someone may tell you, or regardless of what someone say, the body, the soul just floats or it goes away or it disappears. No, it doesn't go away. It lives on. It either lives in eternal darkness, where one continues to live each day in decay, like I saw, or one lives in eternal glory and majesty and joy, and life. There's a choice to be made. And if you're one that has not made the choice, it's no time to die. The choice has to be made now. For now, the Bible says, is the time of your visitation. Now is the time of your salvation. Now is the time to say where you are right now, to put your hand upon your heart, Jew or Gentile. In the quietness and in the sanctity of your heart, say, Yeshua Jesus, heal me. Come into my life that I may be a child of God, that you would cause me to be born from above, that you would, as a Jewish person, show me my Messiah, that you would show me Yeshua, my Messiah. You may be a prominent rabbi. You may be a prominent rabbi in Jerusalem, and you're hearing this, and no one is around, and I'm saying to you, 
grab a hold of the truth of your Messiah that you already know, you've already been stirred, you've already been quickened, you've been, something's been gnawing away in your spirit about Yeshua. And now is the time and now is the day and the moment. I ask, Father, that you, Lord, would visit all those who are right now reaching for you. Right now, they're calling to you. Right now, they're in their hospital room. There's a cancer patient. There's someone, Father, that got into a serious accident and maybe in a, is in a coma and there's no hope. I pray, Father, that you awaken them. Awaken them. Visit them, Lord, supernaturally. Let their a wave of salvations go out through the airways of this program. And we give you glory and honor, Father, for all that you do, for all that who you are, for everything, Father, about the majesty and the perfection And I thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die for us. That you loved us so much that you gave your only begotten son that we would have life and that we would have it abundantly. That Yeshua was, was, and I say was, the Passover lamb that fulfilled the Pesach and gave his life for us. In Hashem Yeshua, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that, Felix. And Felix, I want to make sure we give you an opportunity to mention your book. Give us the, the title of your new book, and where can people pick up a copy of that? Uh, the, the name of the book is A Rabbi's Journey to Heaven. It comes with a CD teaching and a prayer guide called the Heaven Soul Cleanse. Uh, they can pick that up on Sid Roth Ministries. They're, they're, they're producing it for us. Um, so I just uh, encourage everybody, get on Sid Roth's website and buy the book. And, yep. uh, and actually buy one for a loved one. Um, your life will be changed. Uh, if you can give God 30 days out of a year, if you can give God just 30 days and you're willing to take a vacation from your problems, to be with God for 30 days and follow the instructions, I guarantee it, you will, your life will be changed. And we'll make it easy for everybody. If you want to uh, go ahead and get the book and the teaching that goes along with it, I'll have a link to the exact product page on Sid's website. So you can just click right through and pick up a copy. And like Felix said, pick up a copy for friends and family. Uh, if, you've, if you've stayed with us at this point in the broadcast, uh, you hear how Felix's life has been transformed, how Randy's life has been transformed, uh, and God wants to transform your life through this message. And he'll definitely use that resource to do it. Uh, again, for all of you who've been following us throughout the season, we just appreciate you being a part of every Two Christian Dudes episode. Uh, like, share, review all the things that help get the word out about podcasts. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, we are in the midst of our last few near death experience interviews. We are transitioning into uh, our second season pretty soon. We will be talking about angels, demons, deliverance, exorcism, the unseen realm. Uh, that's kind of the general umbrella for the topic. I don't know exactly what we'll call it, but um, that is where we're going for season two. But have no fear, we will get back to heaven encounters and near death experiences for season three. Uh, which will likely start out early uh, in 2022. So again, we appreciate Thanks, you being God. part of the broadcast. Felix, just thank you so much for sharing your powerful journey. I, I love that we got to hear about uh, you encountering Jesus as Messiah and that early part of your journey and yeah. then your heaven encounter and how that's transformed your life still. I know this is going to touch a very unique part of our audience and lives are going to be transformed. Thank you for sharing with us. It was wonderful. Can I, I'd like to bring forth the ironic benediction. Can I do that? Please, please end us that, that way. We'd that love okay? that. Okay. Yavarecha Adonai ve'ishmarecha. Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'ichonecha. Yasa Adonai panavalecha ve'asem lecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you his ever increasing shalom, his peace. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you for that, Felix. And again, thank you for your grace and everything that you bring. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you, Felix. And again, for all of you who've watched this episode, thank you. We appreciate you. And we'll see you again soon on another episode of Two Christian Dudes. Bye. God bless. Thank you.